Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service on this beautiful sunny day. Um, there are some sheets in the back with eggs on them that you are invited to color and return to um, Beth. It is the fellowship uh, fundraiser. So if you want to include some money with that, that's good too. Want to um, make sure that you know we are having a Monday Thursday service. It'll be from noon to six. And what it is, it's um, prayer stations. So you were invited to come at any time during that, um, that period and um, walk the prayer stations. And of course, we will be meeting next Sunday for Easter Sunday. And come one, come all. Um, during the opening hymn, I invite you to wave your palm. March around if you want to. That's good, too. Today, we come to the end of the Lenten season. We started the season with plants and people in many different places. Some may have put their plants in the windows. Um, some may have put them on the bedsides or on their tables. Um, some of us added other activities during Lent. And yet wherever we did or didn't place our plants or wherever we gave up or added something, we, and perhaps the plants, mine did and then didn't, grow. <laughs> um, some grew tall, some grew wide, some of us learned new skills, others of us learned that we can let something we had grown accustomed to die. The end result is that in this season of Lent, we have all actually grown in some way. In our faith, in our spiritual journeys, in our personal lives. And Jesus grew with us. In both our times of dying and in both our times of new life. So today, we come to be present with Jesus as he grows into death so that we might live. Let us worship. Thank you. 
Let us stand. Let us enter the city of God today and shout our hosannas to the King. Let us join the walk toward freedom and follow Christ's path into wholeness. Let our hearts ache for justice and mercy and weep for peace and freedom. Let us turn our backs on the power that grasp for control and follow the one who brings life. Let us walk in solidarity with the abandoned and oppressed and welcome the broken and the sick. Let us touch and see as God draws nigh, riding in triumph toward the cross. With our palms, our coats, our scarves, whatever, let us welcome Jesus into our presence. tradition um, of following the lectionary readings um, during our worship services. In year B, which is the one we're in, the lectionary, the gospel reading for today, is found in Mark chapter 14, verse 1, through chapter 15, verse 47. As a result, this Sunday presents both opportunities and challenges. On the one hand, the reading of the entire Passion narrative reminds the church that the reading of scripture is itself a form of proclamation. On the other hand, the Passion narrative is really long and to combine it with a sermon, well, let's just say you all might miss your lunch. So on this Sunday, I didn't think there needed to be a formal sermon. I know you're all cheering about that. But the reading of the passion narrative is itself a service. And it serves as a proclamation of the word. As our story of Jesus begins, um, Jesus is spending the evening with his disciples. And a woman enters and begins to anoint, to wash Jesus' feet in fragrant oil. Some of the disciples consider this a waste of resources and get upset about it. But Jesus notes that her small deed, her gift to him, will make an impact on our lives such that it will be remembered for generations to come. As you hear the story of the anointing, consider Consider what you may have done for others that will live on 
not only in their lives, but in the lives of future generations. Okay, this worked all the way up here. The Passover and the Feast of the Unleavened Bread were two days away. The Jewish leaders and the chiefs, priests, and the scribes gathered to discuss how they might secretly arrest Jesus and kill him. While Jesus was eating dinner in Bethany at the house of Simon the leper, a woman came into the house carrying an alabaster flask with a precious, sweet-smelling ointment made from the spikehard. She came to Jesus, broke the jar, and gently poured out the perfume onto his head. Some of those around the table were troubled by this and grumbled to each other. Why did she waste this precious ointment? We could have, we could have sold the ointment for almost a year's wages, and the money could have gone to the poor. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why are you attacking her? She has done nothing wrong. She has done a good thing. The poor will always be with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you want, but I won't always be with you. She has done what she could for me. She has come to anoint my body and prepare it for burial. Believe me when I tell you that this act of hers will be told in her honor as long as there are people who tell the good news. Next one works. Mark 14, 10 through 25. It was after, after this that Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to meet the chief priest with the intention of betraying Jesus to them. When they heard what he proposed, they were delighted and promised him money. So from this time on, G Judas thought and waited and sought for an opportunity to betray Jesus. On the first day of the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, the customary day when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples wondered where they would celebrate the feast. Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover meal? That evening, Jesus and the twelve arrived and went into the upper room that the disciples had found. As they reclined around the table, Jesus said to the disciples, I tell you in absolute sincerity, one of you eating with me is going to betray me. The twelve were upset. They looked around at each other and one by one declared, Lord, it is not I, is it? Jesus replied, it is one of you, the 12, one of you who is dipping your bread in the same dish that I am. As they ate, Jesus took the bread, 
offered a blessing and broke it. He handed the pieces to his disciples. Take this and eat it. This is my body. He took a cup of wine, and when he had given thanks for it, he passed it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood, a covenant, poured out on my behalf for many. Truly, I will never taste the fruit of the vine again until the day when I drink it new from the kingdom of God. The story of the Last Supper reminds us that we are not to pick and choose who gets to come to Christ's table. For even those who betray us have a place at the table. It is a reminder that even when we feel that another does not deserve um, our help, that God feels differently. And that's one of the reasons that we give our offerings to Christ's church, so that his church may offer a place at the table to everyone. Please remember to continue giving in this time so that our ministries can continue to be shared with those who want to come to the table here and around the world. Join me in our prayer of dedication. The crowds offer you their coats to walk on, their wave their palm branches honoring your presence. Today we honor you, Lord, with our faithful tithes and offerings. We lay these gifts before you, humble tokens of our love, a public display of affection for our King of Kings. Amen. Give me just a second here. I want to try some. In her, in her book, Learning to Walk in the Dark, theologian Barbara Brown Taylor says, one of the hardest things to decide during a dark night is whether to surrender or resist. The choice often comes down to what you believe about God and how God acts, which means that every dark night of the soul involves wrestling with belief. Just when, just when we believe our faith has grown to a place where we really understand what God needs from us, something happens that places fear in our hearts, a fear that causes us to run from rather than to God. The disappointment we feel in ourselves brings into our souls a sorrow that is so deep, it causes a weariness that we often lose hope. And it's in those times that Jesus calls us to come in to God's garden.
Does it work? Try it.
a kiss was a traditional greeting. A disciple would greet his teacher with a kiss on the cheek or beard to show honor and submission. The less important person initiated the kiss. This is the irony in the passage that we just heard. Judas used something meant to honor to betray. How often, how often do our thoughts, our words, our actions betray the trust that others have placed in us? How often do our actions cause another to feel alone, estranged from the world? Do we offer the kiss of death or a life-giving act? discussion centered around the American tendency to overvalue our individual rights over what's best for the collective whole. One of the participants in that conversation noted that as much as we proclaim that we are individuals and um, it's that's not the case, and you only need to look at a class picture from your school days, especially high school, to disprove that. There is often a commonality in those pictures of hair lengths and clothes styles. 
We spend an enormous amount of time and effort and money trying to fit in with those whose opinions we value. And why do we do this? Because no matter how much we declare others' opinions don't matter, much like Peter, we fear being the outsider. Soldiers and the detachment 
so much or who I should say do you fear so much that you would like them to be crucified as much as we want to deny deny this there is there is not one of us not one who if we are honest can say there is not someone we would like to have crucified. And so we come at last to the execution site, a hill called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. The soldiers offer Jesus wine mixed with myrrh to dull his pain, but he refused it. And so they crucified him, divided up his clothes, and cast lots which is an ancient equivalent of rolling dice, just to see who would keep the clothes that they had stripped from him. His crucifixion began about nine o'clock in the morning. Over his head hung a sign that indicated the charge for which he was being crucified. It read, the King of the Jews. On the other side of him were two insurgents who also received the death penalty. And the Hebrew scripture was completed that said he was considered just another criminal. Those passing by on their way into and out of Jerusalem insulted and ridiculed him. Some of the crowd called out, so so you're the one who's going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Well, if you're so powerful, then why don't you rescue yourself? Come down from that cross. Chief priests and scribes mocked Jesus among themselves saying, he rescued others, but he can't rescue himself. Let the anointed, the king of Israel, come down from the cross now, and we'll see it and believe it. Even the insurgents who were being crucified next to him taunted him and reviled him. At noon, the day suddenly darkened, the sky suddenly darkened for three hours over the entire land. Sometime around three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lema shabakani. Jesus was speaking as in the Psalms, my God, my God, why have you turned your back on me? 
Some of those standing nearby misunderstood him. Hey, he's calling for Elijah. One of them filled a sponge with wine that had turned to vinegar and lifted it up to Jesus' lips on a stick so he could drink. Another declared, let's see if Elijah will come and take him down. And then Jesus cried out in a loud voice, and he took his last breath. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The Roman centurion, the soldier in charge of the execution, stood in front of Jesus, heard his words, and saw the manner of his death. And he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. Off in the distance, away from the crowds, stood some of the women who knew and had followed Jesus, including Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of the younger John, Joses, and Solomon. These were the women who used to care for him when he was in Galilee, and many of the other women who had followed Jesus to Jerusalem joined them. Evening came. The crucifixion had taken, on, had taken place on Preparation Day, Friday, before the Jewish Sabbath began at sundown. Joseph of Arimathea, a member of the ruling council, who was also a believer, anxiously waiting for the kingdom of God, went to Pilate and boldly asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate could not believe Jesus was already dead, so he sent for the centurion confirmed it. And then Pilate gave Joseph permission to take the body. Joseph had the body wrapped in linen burial cloth that he had purchased and laid him in a tomb that had been carved out of rock. Then he had a stone rolled over the opening to seal it. The long passion reading from Mark 14 through 15 should move us to tears. Tears of obedience, of suffering, deception, betrayal, indifference, abandonment. Tears of grace, faith, and tender care for a lifeless body. This is our story, the final chapter in the life of Jesus. Without this story and the story of Easter, nothing else in our Christian history makes sense. This story is God. God dying with us. God dying for us. And God offering us new life. Please stand for the benediction. God, we thank you for being with us in this wondering moment where we stand poised between life and death, filled to the brim with sorrow and filled with thoughts of what has been and what lies before us. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for our friend Jesus, who was a gift to the world and a gift in each of our lives. Comfort us even when we are shaken by the horror of the last hours. Be our friend in this time of sorrow and sustain us in the days to come. As we move into Holy Week, a reminder that on Thursday, you are welcome to come anytime between noon and 6 p.m. for our prayer stations. And Easter service is on person and in line on Sunday at 10. Um, I hope you will join us that day as we celebrate the risen Christ. And now may God bless you and keep you. May the face of God shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may God's presence embrace you and give you eternal peace. Go to serve the Lord. Amen.
Thank you.